Hello and welcome to another episode of Football Today. I'm your host, Josh Schneider-Weiler, and today I am joined by football broadcaster David Goss. David, are you excited to talk about the wild, weird, and wonderful career of Kareem Benzema? I am extremely excited. Josh, I pushed this topic on you, but I think you were happy to take it. Um, I look at Benzema, especially this over the last year, how he's now the star of Real Madrid and the way he's powered this team. And he's such an interesting person because I think he sits in a lot of interesting conversations about how we perceive the game, what we care about, what matters. And you got to come off the bat and say, Kareem Benzema is a bit of a scumbag sometimes. And the Valbuena stuff, which we will talk about, I, in my mind, always comes first. But then when you talk about him as a soccer player, it is really fascinating. And I'm really excited to go into. I've got about 18 reasons why he's underrated, which that amount of reasons alone, I think, tells you how interesting his story is. Yeah, I mean, we have literally nine pages of notes here, and <laughs> I, I, that's like only scratching the surface. Um, but you know what? The first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Benzema is his days at Lyon, because as I mentioned in the last episode, those Lyon teams were when I kind of first really fell in love with French football and mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, European football in general. And he came at the tail end. And I, I think you know, before we talk about his time at Real Madrid and what he's doing right now, I think we really need to go back to those days. And it feels like really a lifetime ago, seriously, like that Lyon was just dominating French football and he was part of that. And uh, this is we're talking about in the late 2000s, uh, 2005, 6, 7, 8 um, and 9. Uh, when he was at the club and you know we can just kind of start um, he grew up in Lyon himself so he was kind of a local boy uh, his nickname was Coco uh, which means coconut in French and uh, you know you see this mentioned in a couple articles and no one explains why and I, I kept trying to think of reasons like maybe he's got a tough exterior or, I, but I really couldn't think of anything because no one explains it but you don't uh, think it it's because of his one. head <laughs> it could be. It, could, it literally could be that simple. I don't Nothing know. Nothing looks like a coconut. <laughs> it's a. It's a well formed coconut, but it's definitely coconut esque. Well, it's helping him head balls for goals. So, like, True. definitely that. You know, it's a major asset. If that. If that is it, it is. It's actually absolutely brilliant, and I will be calling him coconut in the future. Um, <laughs> but there's a great anecdote from when he. Uh, so he's a great youth player um, at Lyon and. Um, there's a great little story that's mentioned in a lot of the profiles about him, about when he arrived to the senior team. And, um, you know, like a lot of kind of coming of age rituals, he had to go up, stand up and speak to his new teammates, um, which, you know, it's just absurd. The, te the team that was there at the time, Michael Essien, Sylvian Wiltord, Florent Maluda, Eric Albidal, like, I mean, the list goes on of guys. Um, that was Janino, like huge list. And, um, while speaking, Benzema was, you know, obviously joked at and laughed at, um, to which he said, quote, do not laugh. I'm here to take your place, end quote, which like just kind of shows also his one, his arrogance, but also like <laughs> dude was not to be played around with. Like clearly, you know, um, dude was a hard guy. Um, I mean, he grew up with eight other siblings. Mm. I always think that like people that grew up with like a ton of siblings, have something different about them. He's got eight. Like that's not a like that's not a joke. He's yeah. The you got to survive youngest. just to get out of the house before yeah, you got to like, survive the world around you. And he's the third youngest. So like he's got six older brothers and sisters. So and also in a really rough area. Um, I'm not an expert, you know, on on France, but uh, it was in an immigrant community. There was a lot of you know racism when it came to housing in France. I don't know if there still is, but back when he was growing up, there was a lot of racism in terms of... There is still, Josh. You know, well, Spoilers. in terms of public housing, probably. But um, And uh, he just grew up in a really rough area and that kind of, you know, made him a really tough guy. And, you know, that's kind of his, his origin story. And it all kind of kicks off for him in 2007, 2008 with a, just an absolute awesome crew. Um, <laughs> tell him who was on that team, Dave. Uh, well, so... Uh, Florent Maluna, John Carew, and Sylvian Wiltord all left, which means Benzema comes in as the center forward on that team. I think Milan Baros was on that team as well. 
Yeah. Um, oh, but, Lloyd, and by the way, he was rocking the 10, rocking the 10 jersey. Yeah. And I think we're going to touch on that and why that's actually like really interesting uh, as well. But um, yeah, really, really awesome uh, team. Uh, I think Loic Remy was a part of that group. Juninho was still there. Uh, mm. Tiago was there. It's a pretty incredible group. And everyone, I think, remembers, as you said, those Leon groups and how good they were. Um, but after struggling for minutes earlier in his career, he gets into the team and scores some huge Champions League goals. So he scores a double at Rangers, um, at Ibrox, in the final group sta- match day of the group stage uh, that pushes them into the knockout rounds. And then Leon faces Man U in the knockout rounds. He scores a goal. And after the game, Sir Alex Ferguson and all the players are praising Benzema for his performances and what he's done and the player that he's become. And then later on, Sir Alex basically says that he wanted to sign him and he would have signed him, except the number that F- Fiorentina, uh, Florentino Perez was willing to sign him at was ridiculous and he wouldn't touch it. Yeah, and and it's actually even more interesting than that. You're like, okay, so he might have ended up at Manchester United instead of maybe like, I don't even know who at the time they would have gotten, like Berbatov maybe, um, or like Luis Carlos Saha. Tevez or, yeah. But inst- and the actually the other club that, Really, he might have ended up at was Barcelona, of course, the rivals of Real. And there is a story of uh, the sporting director at the time, Tiki Bergenstein, flies down to Lyon and they've already agreed uh, more or less on the fee of 30 million euros. And then kind of it just all falls apart. And there's like whispers that he's essentially like the Nikas Anelka, you know, mm. character who's like a talented guy, but. Um, is just kind of too introverted and can't handle, you know, the the big lights of Barca and the feel kind of, the deal kind of falls apart because they kind of back out and it's not to be. And so like you can't help like when I was reading that story, I was like, holy shit. Like, could you imagine him with like Messi and you know some of the guys that 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 played after? You I mean we would never have Suarez there, right? Probably. You know, um but what's interesting about that story, uh, and you read it and wrote it out for me, which to me was so the other people around Barcelona felt that way about Anelka. And so Chiki went down to Benzema's home and his area to do a little bit more research of him, cult- like yeah. culturally and socially, and felt like the group around him and the way he interacted with them maybe wasn't safe for going forward for his ability to be a high-level professional. Yeah. And that's the one thing I actually think they may have gotten right in that. Not that Benzema wasn't a great player. But his friends that he grew up with definitely had a negative impact in the end on what mm. happened to him. It didn't affect Real Madrid specifically, but it definitely mm. affected France and affected Benzema as a person. Yeah. And you can argue, you know, and we'll get onto it maybe right now. Like if he doesn't go to Real Madrid and have the influence of Zidane, does it work? Uh, because... Yeah. I mean, so he ends up going in the summer of 2009 to Real Madrid. And that is the the famous summer where they sign pretty much like half the transfer market and spend over 250 million euros. And they get Kaká for 65 mil. They get Ronaldo for 94. And they get um, Raul Albiol. It was funny when I saw the research. And I was, they, you know, they throw in Albiol with that big number. And you're like, I honestly can barely remember him playing, you know, for that uh, team. Xavi Alonso as well. Yeah. In that and, window. Yeah. And so, like, you know, he gets brought in. And, of course, he's, like, kind of an afterthought. Um, mm-hmm. At the time, Gonzalo Higuain was already at the club. Raul was already at the club. And, I mean, imagine trying to – you're a young – and he's 21. And that's the other thing. Like, most people, when they go to Real Madrid, they are not 21. I mean, it's hard to – or, you know – we think now of Vinicius and Rodrigo and okay, yeah, but like, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. But back then it wasn't like that at all. You were normally an established star of like five years, 20, at least 23, 24. I mean, he's at the age of 21 trying to break into that team. That's crazy. And the confusing thing was, or at the time, the way I remember it is Iguain was a young star at river that was brought in to be Raul's replacement. So it felt like yeah. they'd already filled that spot. And as you said, they don't really bring in young players a lot. They'd spent a big number on Iguain and Gago coming from Argentina in that same window to kind of be the future of the team behind the Galacticos. So then bringing Benzema in just felt like, and it, I think we feel this way with a lot of the big teams, especially nowadays, is just stacking numbers just mm. in case. It didn't really make sense where Benzema was going to fit in. 
Yeah, and you know, the, and the thing is, and and you, is that Iguain actually played well. Like mm-hmm. he scored twenty seven goals that first year that um, Benzema came, um, and this was also just for like a little context under Manuel Pellegrini. And yeah, so like it, really hard to break into that team. And that first year, he struggled, and it was well known. Scored eight goals, and I think a, a lot of times it's just who we are as humans. First impressions make a big deal make a big difference and he had a really rough first year and so real madrid fans were not really huge benzema admirers at that point you know and and you know to be honest like understandably so i mean getting eight goals for 30 million 35 million uh euros is not a great return and that year of course they didn't win the league although like it's crazy looking back they they got 96 points that season um and scored 102 goals man um what times in La Liga? <laughs> yeah, and then Pellegrini got fired. Hence, what times in La Liga? And that's what it was like. Then Mourinho comes in and takes over, and I think a lot of us remember the Mourinho years or some of the Mourinho years, wherever it is yeah. that he was. Uh, and that's when Benzema takes the number nine shirt. And it makes sense that they just don't fit as people, right? Mourinho has an expectation of a style of professionalism, doing things exactly the way he wants it, having a a specific image, I think, for players and positions and what they need to do. And Benzema doesn't fit any of that. Uh, And this is a quote from Mourinho in a press presser. He said, if you don't have a dog to go out hunting with you and you have a cat, you have to go out with the cat. You'll catch less, but you'll catch something all the same. And that's not what you want to hear from your manager at any point about you, especially as a position like goal scorer where you run on confidence. And there was questions about Benzema's physique uh, and his professionalism and Laurent Blanc had similar questions about Benzema coming out of the French national team at the same time so you mentioned that first year but I think Josh is this first spell where there's question marks and almost commonly pure negativity around Benzema in the Madrid camp and uh, not only that but Remember, he's just like 22 at the time. And we know Mourinho, not a huge fan of young players as well. Uh, likes his, you know, veterans on the team. And also, I mean, this is when Barcelona are at their apex. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of pressure on Real Madrid to usurp them. And, you know, that bleeds into Mourinho. And then, of course, um, the next season, you know, the, that season happens. And, uh, you know, this is when they bring uh, even Emmanuel Adebayor on loan. Gotta do um, it sometimes. But, but like, like in football, a lot of this shit comes down to luck. And what happens, Iguain has a serious back injury in November 2010. And therefore, Benzema's thrust into the starting lineup. And he pretty much hasn't stopped starting since... November 2010. Then 2011, um, in the summer of 2011, is when it really pops for him. Really, really pops and loses a bunch of weight. When you read about this, Murano, Italy, what what, what, what image came into your mind? Um, uh, you know, this high performance clinic in like, you know, essentially like some like Lake Como, like luxurious ass resort in Italy. Which I um, think Pirlo is pretty closely associated to as well. I think he spent some time here. Um, but in my head, it was basically you were sending him to rehab to lose weight. And that's how I saw it was like, put him in a corner by himself and just make him focus on this one thing. Uh, and it was weird re- reading this because I think uh, I talked to a bunch of people coming into this episode about their thoughts on him. And the first answer was always like, well, you know, he's overweight. And so that's like kind of one of the images of him. But physically, he has not been for such a long time. Yeah, that you don't see it on the screen anymore, and you don't. I see forgot it. In it his honestly, movement. yeah, yeah I me forgot too. It. But yeah. everyone else remembered it. It was like the first thing a lot of people said about him. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I like you know, I almost thought like when I read this at, at first, like because of how drastic the the change was. I mean, they they said it was something like seven, eight kilograms lighter, and you know, uh, built up his muscle. I, I mean, I couldn't help but think like some performance enhancing drugs in here. <laughs> like honestly, ah. but um, I'm not saying that happened. I'm not saying that happened at all, but like you couldn't, I couldn't help but think cause like it's the they, Jonah they, Hill diet, Josh, if yeah. you get rich, then you can and famous, <laughs> then you can get super fit. But you know, this also brings into kind of the main protagonist who we've already alluded to in his, you know, career. And that is Zidane. And he's, 
widely credited as kind of the pers- person who pushed him to go there and uh, to do this. And, you know, at, when he comes back into it, you know, there's a great Jose Mourinho quote, Kareem now views football the way I view football. And it really comes down to that. Like he was ne- then at that physical peak to kind of thrive and do what he had to do. And that's, you know, the kind of the rest is history. They score 21 goals or he scores 21 goals um, and 32 in total in all competitions. And they win that title that year. And, you know, Mourinho is is lauded and celebrated and, you know, they kind of uh, are able to, to throw the monkey off their back. Uh, that is Barcelona. And it's kind of that relationship with Zidane. It seems from my point of view, going back through all of this, that is the main catalyst for his success. And I, I really do wonder how successful he would have been had it not been for Zidane, who he talks about as being like a brother. And a lot of people's image over the last few years, you know, now Zidane has the Casemiros, the Cruces, the Modric, Sergio Ramos, these guys that he trusts and values. Benzema's in that group. And I agree with you. And it was interesting um, seeing a lot of people say, well, uh, over the years, Madrid fans have said, oh, we need a better striker, but Benzema is Zidane's guy. And it's like, but it's also inverse, right? Where Zidane's Benzema's guy. And as you said, that connection, that relationship has gotten the best out of both of them, I think. And it's been so influential to what's happened in Real Madrid. Four Champions Leagues uh, in Karim Benzema's time. And I think a lot of that has to do with, as you said, this relationship between the two of them both as French Algerians, uh, both as Frenchmen living in Madrid. And I think, as we'll talk about it, the style that Benzema plays in, it actually fits more to what Zidane was as a player than maybe as a true natural number nine. And I think that was part of what really worked for Benzema was Zidane valued who he was on the field and could be and what he did for the team when a lot of other managers wanted other things from Benzema that just weren't comfortable for him. Yeah. And I mean, he was, uh, Zidane helped him in every way possible. Like, you know, after that first year, uh, Benzema didn't really speak much Spanish and he was like, dude, get on your Spanish, man. Like (laughs) it'll never make sense that a club like Real Madrid doesn't just have tutors lined up, have, they spend 96 million euros on a player. You're not going to give them Spanish lessons and tell them that that's a major part of what they need to do. Well, actually, to be fair, I actually know someone who used to tutor, an English tutor who used to tutor Real Madrid players. So I don't think it's that they didn't in know, but I just, or in Spanish? yeah, in English, in English, or sorry, no, sorry, in, um, uh, no, in English, sorry, yeah, <laughs> now that I think about it, yeah, it was not in Spanish. Um, so like, yeah, actually, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so just, they need to learn to speak Spanish that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you're totally right. Like, so he was a huge influence on him. And I, I think that is kind of at the crux of him. Cause when I was thinking of him is like, he's kind of the precursor to Firmino in many ways. And, um, I feel like you had like a lot of people have had the same kind of argument with Firmino, although to be fair to him, he's also scored much more than Firmino mm-hmm. has. Yep. So like, I don't want to say that's like a, a totally apt comparison, but like, there's a reason why his number when he was at Lyon, I almost feel like was 10 and not yeah. nine. And it, to me, he really is, his, you know, a, a kind of a mix. And I, I think someone even said, I think it even might've been his quote is I'm a number nine and uh, I'm a nine, I'm a 10 in a nine's body. That was hmm. Benzema's quote a few years ago about himself. Interesting. Yeah. And that, that really epitomizes, you know, kind of his game and how he operates and, it's funny when you look at his goal scoring, it's not remarkable. But then actually, if you combine his goals and assists, mm-hmm. you know, per 90 minutes and it, you put it up against anyone and it's pretty much there. I mean, uh, I have it, you know, here on Football Reference, Lewandowski, Latan, Harry Kane, Suarez. It's all comparable to all of them. But you have to include goals and assists together. If you just put goals, he's not there. He's just although. Not. In goals, he's what third all time or fourth all time in Real Madrid history. Totally, yeah. He's he's got the goal like bona fides of a of a really good player, but just right. not like a special player. Not of some of the people that we just mentioned. He's not scoring twenty five league goals a season. You know, like he's never gone goals. over thirty. I think that was the number that jumped out to me. So he's fifth all time in Real Madrid 
mm. uh, goals ahead of Pushkas, ahead of Hugo Sanchez. Uh, but that was the big one that jumped out at me. So he basically goes over 20 every year. That's which, not, well, um, that's not true. That's not true. Um, uh, the years that he's been a star, I think he has only missed it four four times or three times in his 10, 10 plus years there. Um, but he he's never gone over 30, which I think that is that space that you're talking about where it's he's good, bordering on great as a goal scorer. But the elite part for him comes from his production, um, double digit assists. I think it was three or four seasons, eight or nine, a couple seasons as well. And that a massive part of what he's been able to do. Well, I, I mean, I'm just going to push back because the, the fans need to know the facts. Dave. Okay, go. We're not into fake news here. He only scored more than in to, I'm talking about league goals. So not uh, goals in all competition. Total comps each year in league goals four times. And I think also the thing that really dings him as well is he had a truly atrocious year. One year, 2017, 2018, 32 league games, five goals. And that season, he had, you know, an XG of essentially 14. So he underperformed by nine goals. And just like five goals for an elite club like Real mm-hmm. Madrid is just like pretty much inexcusable. Um, and so, yeah, four, four times in more than a slightly more than a decade, getting more than 20 league goals is not great. But as you said, like a lot of those are like in the high teens as well. So it's also Real Madrid. So they win the Champions League. So that's all that matters after the exactly. time on these. Exactly. Um, you know, so like, Dave, what were some of the other reasons you found that you thought he was um, underrated? You said you had 18 at the beginning. Yeah, of that, this. That's that's uh, more than do you want to start soccer or non-soccer? Whichever, man. OK, so I think one of the biggest ones is his personality. And there's an image of what a goal scorer is. There's an image of what a star player is. And he fits a, a fair amount of those. Uh, how much does his Bugatti cost? Three mil. Yeah. So Three that, that's pretty star player is. You know, I just gave a quote that he's a nine in a tense body. Can you think of another Kareem Benzema quote? Can you even picture him doing the press conferences pre and post game? And I think for most people, he's not this big personality. And especially Hmm. playing alongside Cristiano Ronaldo that you expect from a star player. And so I think that's one of the big ones with Benzema is uh, we always hear, oh, a great striker has to be angry. They have to want goals. They have, you know, you have to feel it. And you think of Henri and you think of Cantona and you think of Del Piero and guys like that. Uh, and I don't think Benzema fits into any of that. And so I think that's one of the reasons you see him not get mentioned even now. Right. Because yeah. right now you you could argue he's the top three striker in the world. And I would argue He's probably number one. If you want to put Lewandowski number one right now, even though he's hurt, that's fine. I don't think most people even mention him in that conversation. No, I, I mean, I don't even think it's a question. He won player of the year in in uh, Spain last year. Um, and no one's talking to him about him for Ballon d'Or, which is like if you're uh, Spain's top player, right. you're a shoe in to be a top five Ballon d'Or candidate almost. Uh, and he wasn't even discussed. Uh, recently so yeah I, I completely agree with you and i think it's not only that but he's been overshadowed you know he's been in the shadow of ronaldo and he's an unselfish player right it's not even just ronaldo right you have ronaldo at uh, real madrid and ramos you know mm-hmm. when he first came to the team i mentioned kaka you had Iker casillas um you have all of these mega stars and like he's always been like happily by the way like not in the limelight like he's 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 not a you know, extroverted figure. He's just not. He's an, he's you know he's an introvert. Most of his friends are still all, like uh, um, his childhood friends, as far as I can tell. And yeah, he's just not. Oh, although I say that the irony is that like he's got a YouTube channel. He's like, you know, tr- you know, tries like right. uh, like I don't know if you saw any of those YouTube videos, but like you know, he tried to he tries to have that like kind of Floyd Maywe- Mayweather like look like I got the bling bling and all that good stuff. Although he says like that's part of like because he grew up with nothing, you know, and that's yeah. like a very common, uh, you know, thing. So like I don't you know, I'm not, that's not a slight on him. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that like they, he said, like, who does he admire the most? It was Mike Tyson because uh, he said, quote, I also admire Mike Tyson because both he and I came from the bottom and grew. No one gave us anything. And I think that kind of like speaks to kind of who he is and what he's about and uh, also why he's not more famous. And, uh, you know, actually, before we, we move on, like, so we mentioned his $3 million Bugatti uh, car, you know, that can reach 400 kilometers per hour. Dave, if you had to describe him as a car, what would it be? What car would he be? 
So this isn't my area of expertise, but I'm gonna give. Dude, it a we shot. used to go to a car show like I know every year for like eight years. What are you talking but if about? I compare them to a car from 2004. <laughs> no one will know what that means, and it won't mean anything to anyone. But I would just say I think he's is an Audi fair, like a high, a a a, a low end luxury car where it's like you're getting luxury um, appliances mm. and it runs smooth and it's impressive and it's better than other ones. But it's not that high end Aston Martin type car that everyone's going to turn around and stare at as you drive by in. Uh, mm. But you can still drive into the luxury areas and be like, I belong here. Is oh, you know what it reminds me? It reminds me of, I mean, we grew up in a fairly well to do area and it reminds me of the uh, Lexus RX like um, SUV that a lot of uh, the the mothers used to have. Um, the, just to, you know that w- they were really nice cars, but um, definitely not like flashy. Um, I think that's a good one as well. Um, or or maybe the G wagon, the Mercedes G wagon. <laughs> that was the one I thought of immediately. For, like the one that is in uh, the end of the Born Supremacy. Anyway, uh, if you guys know what I'm talking about, but he would be uh, so offended to have us comparing him to these types of cars. No, I think you'd be. Uh, I think you'd be okay with the G wagon. Maybe not the Lexus, but the, I think the G wagon. Because that was a hot thing for a little while. But yeah. Maybe that's yeah. Um, so so my next huge reason why he's underrated. We have to do two at the same time. Are you ready to get into Valbuena stuff now? Yeah, I think uh, we, we, we've gone almost 30 minutes. It's, it's about time. Okay. So my, my big reason I think why he's underrated is that he doesn't play international soccer. The reason he doesn't play international soccer is because he's basically been banned from the French national team, at least under Didier Deschamps now. Josh, why is that? Well, God. Um, actually, before even the Valbuena, like he got caught having sex with a prostitute who turned out to be a minor but um it, the the charges were dismissed because it seems as though he didn't know that she was a minor at the time and this is with a couple of other players so you know he's not the only guy you know to have you know sex with a prostitute that was a minor in this case but you know this really comes down to a story with Mat- uh Matthew Valbuena and uh, essentially his childhood friend and some other people get their hands on a sex tape with Valbuena, who was married at the time, and they essentially try to blackmail him uh, and his childhood friend. Or this is all allegedly. Um, <laughs> and his childhood friend essentially like enlists him to message Valbuena, or so we are told, and say like, "This means business. Um, you got you, Valbuena. You should pay them the one hundred thousand euros." And that's the gist of it that I got. I mean, I don't know if there's like more sorted details and stuff, but that's essentially the the run in the mill of it. Obviously, that's not really cool to do that to another fellow national team player. People are pissed and he gets suspended in December. Of- so I just think it's it it's safe to point out it wasn't Benzema's idea. He didn't yeah. actually carry it out. But what he's being charged for as an accomplice is he knew it was happening and he was talking to Valbuena as Benzema because there was anonymous messages coming into Valbuena saying like, pay this money saying you should do this as you said, and and saying this is serious. Uh, It's shocking. I think the most shocking part comes down to you're a, you, you play for Real Madrid. If your friend needs a hundred thousand euros, you couldn't find a better way to get it for him than blackmailing a teammate for no reason. Yeah. That, uh, That crossed my mind, and I was just like, "There has to be more here." I I mean, and I, because it, I don't want to say that it's a small deal because it's not, but yeah, I mean, I feel like this shit has to happen more common in football than than we know about, and it just doesn't seem like yeah, a hundred thousand is not like a ton for these guys. It's It's very weird. It's the part that goes back to like you said how you know he talked about coming from nothing and then the way you dress and the way you show off your money. And it's unfortunate, right? Like we're all a product of our environments and there's only so much a lot of people can do to change it of you wonder what the mentality was of like, Oh, your friend's asking you to do this. You're there for them for life. They've been there for you forever. Like, what are you willing to do for them? And you don't want to show that you've changed too much. There's like so many things that happen for a player. And I think a lot of Benzema's story, as you were talking about, uh, coming into the show about the politics and the racial identity of North African French um, citizens 
and Muslim French citizens and their experience there. I think that's sort of the other part that was super interesting to me about Benzema is how he's sort of a um, microscope to see the whole thing through and his experience as Zidane was and as Lillian Taram is and as Mbappe is. It's a lot of that in France. But I think this to me is one of those moments with Benzema where you're saying he's a product of his environment. Uh, what does he control? What sort of controlling him and the whole way it works out. Uh, it is now going to be tried. So I guess we will find out yeah. what was really I mean, going on. Uh, only over like the six years later. Year. I mean, yeah. <laughs> pretty much like, um, but I mean, I think it is also interesting that that whole episode, you know, when he was arrested happened in November of 2015, November 4th. And he's suspended from the national team essentially indefinitely. And, you know, from until now starting in December. So like there was not, you know, a whole, I mean, maybe they did like a whole thorough investigation and got everything figured out. I don't, I mean, once again, a lot of the stuff is not public. I mean, if you got a tip, let us know. Um, <laughs> but he gets arrested in November. They suspended in December of 2015. 2016 is when they have the Euros and he is left out of the team. And at that time, um, Famously, Eric Cantona kind of attributes mm-hmm. it to racism. And he says, you know, quote, um, and then Benzema says that Deschamps isn't racist um, and that they'd actually had a good relationship, but he was bowing to pressure from, quote, a racist part of France. And, um, you know, Cantona also said it wasn't just Benzema, it was also Ben Arfa as well, and that there weren't, you know, many North African people on the team. And we sort of skipped over this, but when Benzema came through as a young player, he was part of this class of 87, I think it yeah. was their birth years. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. him, Nasri, Ben Arfa, and Jeremy Menez. All four of them are of immigrant backgrounds in France, three of them being North African. Uh, as we said, and all of their careers kind of didn't follow the path you'd expect. Maybe Benzema technically did on the field, but obviously not for France. Um, and I think that's part of what we're talking about, which is okay, Benzema's issues are self-inflicted, but the issues that, you know, cause him and his friends to do this is deeper in society uh, than what they've done. And then the reaction to it is maybe different than what it would be for another, I don't know if you could say similar problem uh, in this country or in another country. I, I mean, we've seen footballers make mistakes in the world they normally get to come back into teams, right? That's just the sad reality of things. Yeah. And some of them are a lot worse than this. Some of them are violent. Some of them are dangerous, whatever it is. And normally everyone looks the other way. Uh, Can I take a moment here to just talk soccer wise? Sorry, football wise. Mm. Exactly what France needs is a number nine who wants to pick up the ball coming back from goal and create for Mbappe and the other options, Pogba and wingers on this team. Think about the World Cup and why Giroud kept getting in the team at times Mm. over Griezmann was because he was a hold-up forward who made Mbappe better. Now put Benzema in, who's also a borderline elite goal scorer and better at all of those things. Mm. And they lost the 2016 Euro final, obviously, to Portugal at home, as we all know. Um, I think they only scored one. They lost 2-1, right, in the final in extra time. Yeah. And then they, of course, go on to win the World Cup. And think about, like, Mbappe against Argentina, tearing them apart end-to-end, uh, and Croatia. Now stick Benzema in, who was the facilitator for Ronaldo in transition and in the counter as the great goal-scoring winger in history, and put him alongside Mbappe and Pogba and Griezmann and all these pieces – this team would be absurd. And so on one hand, it's just absurd to marvel at the fact that France could still win. Yeah. How much talent they have and how good they are. And on the other hand, it's a little frustrating to think of the team we could have seen with Benzema in there. I mean, I don't really know how much different it would have been because they're still playing largely kind of boring football, to be honest. But um, would it be with him? I don't know. He, I don't know. I don't he, know. His but creativity, I, his buildup is magical. That's where you get it. That was their style and their that was their strategy and that was how they wanted to go. Um, but but I, I just I do want to like uh, mention something that when you read a lot of these articles about that, 
they are actually talking about how that was really good for him in terms of his uh, club football mm-hmm. and that how that gave him the time uh, that a lot of other players don't get when you're at like one of these elite teams like a Real Madrid where literally everyone's on international duty. And this gave him a lot of time to recuperate, co- recover, and also like, you know, get better. So a lot of people actually look at the positives that it gave him. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to just uh, finish there on the, the racism element. There's a really good piece in for, foreignpolicy.com. It, it's, I think the title is, Does French Soccer Have an Arab uh, Problem? And it talks about all of the right wing in France that just piled on again, you know, on Benzema after he made this comment about, you know, essentially he was singled out because potentially of racism. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, just all these leaders, you know, Marie Le Pen, the prime minister, literally the prime minister of Manuel Valls, quote, not the right vision for France. And, and 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 even more of a backdrop to this is after the terrorist attacks, um, the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attacks and the supermarket terrorist attack that happened in France, there was an El Clasico where they had the French anthem sung at it, you know, kind of in memoriam, you know, for those that uh, died in these terrorist attacks. And they zoom in on Benzema you know, thinking, you know, he's French, um, let's get his reaction, maybe it'll be sentimental or whatever. And then kind of right after the anthem, like a lot of players do, he kind of spits some phlegm onto the ground. And a lot of people took that as like a really, you know, a bad thing. And he also doesn't sing the national anthem. Uh, Also, to be fair, like Zidane and Platini um, have it in the past as well. And so that's also another reason people don't like him. And he always said also, Algeria is my country. So there's a lot of a lot of animosity there between a lot of, you know, maybe people in France who were really nationalistic and Benzema, who they maybe don't see as their guy. I mean, he even said like, yeah, Algeria is my country, you know, even though he's playing for France. So there's a lot of, yeah, just like, I also think like it's hard when, you know, you're don't even have your country behind you. He doesn't have, yeah. you know, Lyon fans really, you know, um, and he doesn't have Real Madrid fans like really gunning behind him with support. Yeah, that was a that was a long one, but I think it's important. I think it's important to mention that. No, massively important. Obviously, um, when you look at the 1998 World Cup winning team, the racial breakdown and the backgrounds of those players is a massive part of what happened. Uh, it was always a part of Zidane's legacy, for good and bad, mm-hmm. in a lot of different ways. Uh, and he's had some uh, really tough moments. And I think for a player who many consider to be one of the greats of all times, there was a lot of blowback on his play in moments that made no sense, but it was because of his background and being North African and people were looking for opportunities to jump on him, even when they didn't exist because of how great he was. Uh, And I told you the story before we recorded, but uh, I've heard from the different backgrounds, different places that when he headbutted Matarazzi, this is Zidane, obviously not Benzema, to close out the 2006 World Cup, there was like a massive uproar around it. I always thought it was great personally. I was always a fan of it. I mean, they were going to lose in that shootout 5-4 anyway. Why not go out like a hero? But uh, (laughs) but, uh, the way he hit Materazzi with the headbutt is considered something that people in the public housing projects in France do. And it was almost like to those people, an ode and a wink back to them, saying, I am still that guy. Um, And there were some who adored him even more because of it. But then at the same time, as you said, you've got politicians coming out left and right and public figures and everyone who felt like it, it was a time to jump on him and call him disgusting names and all these things, let alone besides whatever Matarazzi said. And so the, it, it's one of those things where we still see it. That was 15 years ago, right? And the 1988, yeah. the 1998 World Cup they won was 23 years ago. And a lot of this hasn't changed for the better every time People are told it will change. And Benzema, I think, is an example of that. Mbappe will be fascinating as well. Sorry, sorry. I just I was just going to jump in and say, like, Mbappe, just so you, people like know, his mother was born in the same area as the parent, uh, as Benzema's family in um, Algeria. And where's Zidane's family from? They're from, like, the same uh, region and, you know, um, ethnic tribe. So he's not alone in this um, as well. So, so sorry, Dave, I, I keep going. No, so Mbappe, I think... He's come through and he has that air right now of 
He's young. He's a kid. Our hopes are on his shoulders. He's going to become an adult now where he has points of view and personality, similar to we've seen what Rashford's done in England. And it'll be interesting to see how the French general public reacts to those moments uh, when he has points of contention, when he has tough moments, just to see how has any of this progressed. And it's not exactly the same with every person, but I think that's going to be an interesting litmus test from Zidane through Benzema into Mbappe of where the country stands and uh, where racial tensions stand and all those things um, in France. And so you mentioned he doesn't have Lyon and Real Madrid and France fans on his side. I think, again, that's a huge part of the perception of him because on the one hand, you have international soccer, which as much as people talk about whether it matters or not, there are there's one time every four years that everyone in the world tunes in. And that's where you set your tone as a player. We talked about it with Pele. All the greats did it with their national teams. And there are players who football fans know are great. The George Weahs was one of the first that came to mind. He won the ball in door, right? He was considered a great player. But people who don't watch soccer don't know his name. And so you don't get consistently mentioned and pushed into that category. And I think because Benzema didn't play for the national team as long as he could have, didn't play the home Euros because he was pretty good in 2014 in Brazil at a time when 2010 was obviously this huge tragedy. In 2014, the team was rebuilding. They lost to Germany, who won the World Cup. I think no one was upset about that, and it felt like they were on a road going forward, which clearly they were going into 2018. Uh, And I think Benzema's lack of international play, but also international success goes into a major part of why people don't consider him one of the great players. And it's also ironic that he's actually like fourth all time in Champions League goals uh, with 70 and Mm -hmm. um, where you would think like because of the importance of the Champions League, that might not be the case. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, I I mean, I I will be fascinated to see how in like 20 years he is remembered because he'll be like popping up on all these charts. And, you know, what what will people think of him then? Um, I think he will be one of those guys that will be probably more appreciated lit after his career is over rather than in it. Uh, Cause I just think he's, his game maybe doesn't lend itself to the era of how people think of strikers. Um, and it might be more appreciated in a couple of years time. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's my thought for his legacy. Um, I think he's a top striker. I think he belongs with all the guys we mentioned before of the, you know, Suarez and um, Lewandowski's and Canes of the world. Uh, he just did it in a different way. And, you know, the last thing I kind of put on my sheet was I compared him to Henri. And if you look at their numbers side by side, they are virtually the same. It just, they did it in different ways and completely different ways for that matter. And, you know, uh, one had all of the social capital of the world, whereas w- the other didn't. And um, but yet they still had the same numbers. And, um, you know, one is actually probably more successful on the field than the other in, in many ways. But uh, absolutely fascinating guy to look at. And I'm really glad I, I did because I didn't know enough about him before we did this. Um, do you have do you have any final thoughts, Dave? I don't think it's done. So what's interesting to me now is post Ronaldo. Him being the centerpiece, you said it, he won La Liga Player of the Year last year. It feels like they're going to win a trophy again this year, whether it's Champions League or La Liga, and it's all on his back. And I think it it, it doesn't feel like he's coming to his end anytime soon. There's a chance that all of this changes if he becomes the face of Real Madrid in a new period of success. Uh, And I think it's telling that Real Madrid went out and spent on Vinicius and Rodrigo as young guys, but on the wing. And they don't mm. have a center forward behind Benzema, who's ready. Well, to until they get Holland, of course. Potentially. Uh, but what did they do after Ronaldo left? They went and got Hazard, right? And they signed yeah. Odegaard. They haven't signed a center forward. And so if he's the piece that it's all rebuilt around post-Ronaldo, and he's the face of Real Madrid for a few years, that's where I think this could potentially change. It'll be interesting to see how... COVID affects all of this, right? He won player of the year last year, but fans weren't in the stadiums. Maybe people weren't tuned in the way they are. Maybe they don't see the game the same way. Um, Because one of the things about him is he doesn't have an iconic moment. His only goal in a final is Loris Karius throwing the ball off of him. 
and he's the more famous person for that moment than Benzema is. But if he leads them <laughs> to a, a title uh, or or continues to lead him to titles and maybe scores in a Champions League final, that I think has the potential to elevate him and change the way that he's spoken about. And we've seen other players. Um, I think of Pirlo. I think people loved Pirlo, but it was the end with Juventus and the win with Italy, which were later in his career where people shifted into Pirlo is one of the greats of all time versus I just enjoy watching him play. And I think Benzema maybe has a chance to do that over the next few years. Yeah. And, and if they get Mbappe, which isn't out of the realm of possibility, it could be him, Zidane and uh, Mbappe, you know, you get that kind of Northern Al- Algerian uh, ancestry um, on lock in the biggest club in the world, arguably. That would be absolutely wild and uh, absolutely fun to see. But uh, this was also so much fun, Dave. Uh, thanks. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, always fun. Now I'm going to go get some Algerian food. The music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions, and you can find more information about the music in the episode show notes. 